Hello, everybody. I want to talk to you today about another one of my 10 words that can change your life. Uh, this word is forgiveness. And I want to talk to you about keys to forgiveness. Uh, our text is in Genesis chapter 50, uh, beginning at verse 15. Here's what it says. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they, not the father, they sent word to Joseph saying, your father, Jacob, left these instructions before he died. That was a lie. He didn't do that. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before Joseph and said, we're your slaves. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, true, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. That is the first story of forgiveness in the Bible. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For if you forgive not for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Very interesting. Provocative, in fact. God put Joseph through several tasks and tests before he lifted him up to his regal destiny. Now, Joseph had a lot of reasons, valid reasons, for being full of bitterness. He had really been mistreated by the members of his own family. They hated him because of a dream God gave him sold him into Egyptian slavery, put blood on his garments and told his father he'd been killed by a wild animal. Joseph was on his own then to fend in his world as best he could. Now the tables really get turned. Because Joseph becomes the second most powerful man in the world in control of the food supply of the world. And now his brothers come and bow their knee to him, asking for bread. Genesis 50 is the first time the word forgiveness is used in the Bible. And here's what it means. It means to absolve to release fully, and then to bear and lift up the one who has hurt you. Whoa. To, to absolve, all right, <clears throat> wash it away. Number two, release it fully. <clears throat> and then number three, bear and lift up the one who has wronged you. Now, it doesn't say anything about forgetting. You don't have to forget what they did. That's a miscalculation on the part of most of us. Well, you remember it. If you remember it, 
then you haven't truly forgiven. <clears throat> That's not true. Forgetting has nothing to do with it. And it, will, it may even change the way you deal with that person from this point on. But you absolve him or her, release them fully, and then lift them up, not put them down. <clears throat> I want to deal with three keys to forgiveness in this talk today. Number one, the first key to forgiveness is release. His brothers, when they came to him, were still lying. They were, they were still manipulating. They weren't telling the truth at all. They, they said that Jacob said something that he didn't say. Verses 15 through 18 prove that clearly. But you see, true forgiveness doesn't require a change of heart in the offender. We can forgive the offender even while he's in the process of carrying out his offense. The man doesn't have to stop. The woman doesn't have to stop criticizing you, lying about you, stealing from you for you to forgive. Indeed, if, if that's the case, then I wonder if you have truly forgiven. You've just won. His brothers never apologized or truly asked for forgiveness. They went right on their merry way of lying about everything. That brings me to this conclusion. True forgiveness doesn't require a repentant request from the offender. It's pretty easy if somebody has repented and turned their lives around and they're no longer going to do that. If they come and ask you to forgive, 99 people out of 100 would forgive them. Maybe not quite that many, but 9 out of 10 would. And what have you, what have you gotten? No, no, no. You see, forgiveness is not about me and him or her. It's really much more about me and, and him. It doesn't depend on the behavior of the offender. If we refuse to forgive, we put ourselves, Joseph said, in the place of God. He said, don't be afraid. I'm not going to harm you. Am I in the place of God? What, what did he mean by that? Well, vengeance belongs only to God. The Bible's so clear about that in Leviticus 19, 18. It says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear a grudge. Whoa! I don't, you don't avenge, that is, you don't retaliate, and you don't even go around feeling a grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. That's Leviticus 19.18. Now, Hebrews 10.30 deals with that same concept like this. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Now, that person is going to get judged. That person is going to get dealt with. But not by you. You hear? Not by you. He'll get dealt with by God, his own heavenly father. And God knows how to deal with folks who are offenders and offensive. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, 
Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather, here's the key, give place to wrath. Whose wrath? Their wrath? Just let them keep pouring it on you? That's not what that text means. Humbly, I believe that's not what that text means. Give place to wrath, your own wrath. I mean, they keep on and on. It's okay to be angry. Just don't sin. Don't miss the mark. Don't avenge yourself. Why? Because the Bible says, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Let God deal with them. He, he can handle it. He knows all the details. He understands all the motivations. Look, I'd rather some puny guy take vengeance on me for a genuine wrong than to have to face God with it. I mean, he can't bother me when I'm safely in my home under my covers in the middle of the night, but oh, can he ever? So vengeance then means to bring justice to an unjust situation. Now, I can't do that. I, even the state can't do that. They can try. We try to do the best we can with our legal system, but, but God can do that. And believe me, God is a God of balance. So key number one to forgiveness is release. Release the person from your judgment. Release the person from your wrath. You, you can't really make this thing right anyway. Turn him over. Turn them over to God. That's step number one. Now, now, now step number two. And, and the second key to true forgiveness is receive. Release and then receive. Uh, Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Wow. What does this mean? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Well, it has two meanings. And I've written a, a strong book on the Lord's Prayer and another one on the Beatitudes in which I, I deal with these great sayings of Jesus. And let's come to the board, yeah, if you will. And this little word, as, as has, has two applications here, and I believe both of them are appropriate. As means in the same way. In the same way, on the basis of the same principle, as forgive us our sins, our debts, our trespasses, all three, Matthew, Mark, Luke, use, uh, use those three different words. Matthew says trespasses and Mark says sins uh, and uh, um, uh, Luke says, says uh, trespasses and Mark says uh, sins and Matthew is the one who says debts. So, so it means in the same way, forgive like, like God would forgive as best you can. Now, you can't really do that. So it, it has to have this secondary meaning as well. And that means at the same time. Forgive us our sins at the same time that we forgive others their sins against us. Wow. You see, I think that the trigger to being forgiven is to forgive. That if you build up 
unforgiveness and resentment and hold a grudge, then you block God from forgiving you. See, the trigger to being forgiven is to open up the flow of forgiveness in yourself so that it can come back to you. Somebody said, if God can get it through you, then he will get it to you. This is true of so much. It's true of money. It's true of blessing. It's true of joy. If he can get it through you to others, he'll get it to you. Plainly, Jesus bore down on this petition of the Lord's Prayer like, like no other petition of the Lord's Prayer. He said, if we don't forgive others, we will not be able to receive our own forgiveness. Wow. You see, you can't truly receive what you won't give. God abhors a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. God abhors a vacuum. That means that he doesn't want to put something into a place where it can't flow freely to others. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, and running over. If you, if you want to stop receiving, then stop giving. And it's not just true of money. It's true of forgiveness. It's true of love. It's true of mercy. It's true of everything in life. Matthew 10, verse 8, Jesus reminded his disciples that he was sending out on their first ministry tour. He said, go and heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and raise the dead and cast out the demons. Freely you have received, he said. Now, freely give. I know so many people who live as though God is keeping score of their sins. Don't live your life that way. It's not true. God is not keeping score of your sins. Receive his lavish forgiveness and then lavish it on other people. It makes life so easy and so blessed. So the first key to forgiveness is release. The second one is receive. Now the third one is recall. Recall. Remember that God has truly forgiven you. Believe that in every bone of your body. You're not innocent. You're forgiven. You're not perfect. You're forgiven. I'd rather be forgiven than innocent or perfect because that innocence and perfection then depends on me to maintain it. I can't do that. But he maintains my forgiveness. Psalm 103 verse 12 puts it like this. As far as the east is from the west... So far has he removed our transgressions from us. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? As far as the east is from the west. If, if I have come to him and asked him, Father, be merciful to me, a sinner. He has cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. Isaiah 53, 6 puts it like this. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We're all sinners. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Not, not just the act now, but the reason behind the act. You see, sin is one thing. Iniquity is the cause of sin. 
Iniquity is the state of being that expresses itself in sins. God doesn't just deal with the act. He deals with the state of things. He doesn't just wash away my sins. He purges out my iniquity makes me a new creature in Christ. Old things purged away. All things become new. It's a, it's a different world. In 2 Corinthians, Paul comes in, stands on the shoulders of David the psalmist and Isaiah the prophet, and he says, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Him who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, I love to say I'm not just a sinner saved by grace. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you truly believe that you're forgiven, when you truly believe that you're forgiven, then you can cancel the debt of another who owes you. Then you can remit the sins of those who wrong you. I want to tell you a story, a story that really birthed this whole message in me. Before I do, let me give you a formula for dealing with sins against you, reminding yourself of Joseph in the Old Testament. Number one, number one, tell God about the sins against you. Tell God, tell God, tell him seriously. People are so mistaken when they say, if you don't forget, you haven't truly forgiven. That's not true. People have wronged me in my life, and I, don't, I haven't forgotten. And it has built a little wall of separation in certain ways between them and me. I'm not letting them get into me again. That they've asked, but I'm not letting them get that close again. I don't need that. I haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten. I, have I forgiven? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm free. I am free. But I'm not going to take that, that I don't want that venomous viper that bit me so badly before into my bosom again. God chose my family for me. He's my brother but he's not my friend. You see, I don't have to have him as my friend just to forgive him and have him as my brother. There's a world of difference there. See, I don't, I don't have to have daily fellowship with every member of my family for them to be a genuine member of my, my family, physical or spiritual. So remember what they did. Remember the sin against you. Seriously. Recall every detail. Listen, I'm giving you a formula now. This is number one. Remember the sin against you. Relive the anguish. Experience again the pain through memory. Get it up so that you can get it out. Get it up so that you can get it out. You're never going to get it out as long as you just try to leave it down. You know what it'll do? It'll go into your heart or it'll go into your liver or it'll go into some part of your body and it'll affect you physically and spiritually and mentally and emotionally. Unforgiveness is a destroyer. You've got to remember it in order to get it up so you can get it out. 
Number two, once you have done that, you have told God all about it, then remember what he did with your sins against him. Do it seriously. Recall every detail. Write it down. Write it down. In both cases, write it down. Get it up so that you can get it out. Remember what he did with your sins against him. And then reach over and tear up the paper of your offender's sins against you, just like he tore up the handwriting of ordinances against you when you sinned against him. Now, a friend of mine gave me this story out of his own life with lots of tears. He said, when I was a young boy, he said, my parents adopted a child. Uh, he said, this child was alone in the world. He was destitute, abandoned by his family. He had nobody, nothing. So we took him in, and he said, he became my brother. He became my brother, my kid brother I never had. And my sister loved him. She was just a year or two older than me. We all three grew up together, he said. We got the same clothes. We got the same food. We got the same love. We got the same education. He was totally an equal part of our family, my mom, my dad, and the three of us kids. He said, but when he got grown, when he grew up, my dad had died, and I and my sister, being older, had moved out, married, and, and left. She'd gone to Texas, and I'd gone to Oklahoma or somewhere. But when he got grown, he started dabbling around in real estate, and he talked my mother into selling the house, really the only thing she had of any value, and to give him all her money that he was going to take care of it and take care of her, and she wouldn't have to worry about anything if he could just get that, that nest egg to work from. So she did. She trusted him. He was her, her child. He had no sooner gotten that money in his possession than he disappeared in the middle of the night leaving my aging mother with nothing, my friend said. He left in the middle of the night, and nobody knew where he was. He said, now, Ron, I have to tell you, I've served and loved God all my life, but he said, I hated him. If I could have gotten my hands on him, he said, I would have hurt him for what he did to my mom. So my sister found out I was pastoring a big church, he said, and I was struggling to preach the gospel every day and experiencing what I was experiencing. My sister told me she came from Texas to visit me. By that time, he was living in Georgia. She said, you've got to forgive him. You've got to forgive him. It's going to damage your own life and ministry. He said, I know, I know, I know. So he said, I just remembered this formula for forgiveness. And he said, so I, I went away, and I got alone by myself. And he said, I got down in front of God. And he said, I recalled the sins done against us. I began to tell God about them. And as I did, I wrote them down. I wrote them down on a sheet of paper. And then he said, I turned to step number two. 
He said, I remembered what God did with my sins. And I began to write down my sins that God had forgiven me of. He said, and by the time that was over, two or three hours later, he said, I was able to reach over and take that sheet of paper with his sins on it. And I was able to tear that paper up, flush it down the toilet, he said. And when I did, he said, I was free. I was free. My forgiveness had enabled me to be forgiven. My friend, there it is. One of the greatest words in the human language. One of the greatest needs of all of us, indeed, it was the great William James. Greatest psychologist, they tell us, America ever produced, who said, the one thing we want to know more than anything else in the world is, am I forgiven? You can be forgiven. You can be forgiven. Release those who have harmed you. Receive God's forgiveness from your sins. And then recall what he did and repeat that with those who've wronged you. God bless you. I trust you will apply this message to your heart and your life today. This has been brought to you by Ron Cottle Ministries. For more information, please call us at 706-256-0100, extension 217, or visit our website, roncottleministries.com.